Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Joy to be with you this morning. Why don't you grab your Bibles and go ahead and open up to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, the end of the chapter is where we're going to be in just a minute. And I've got to say, everything in me wanted to say open up to the book of Hebrews by habit as we've been there the entire year. But today is different. We kick off something called Neighbors and Nations. And you've already found out that uh, we are in the middle of Neighbors and Nations. And also, I'm not. Selvin Germitis, our Ugandan partner, uh, I officially today get to be a backup, but that's all right. I'm glad to do that, uh, and we know here at Trust Cities that the messenger is much less important than the message, amen? Well, a few of you believe that. Let me just say that again. The message of God's Word is much more important than the messenger, so we're going to be challenged this morning from God's Word. Let me challenge this morning. Let me just let me just kind of set the stage as one of your pastors and elders why we why we do Neighbors and Nations. If you're new, uh, this is an emphasis for us a couple times a year. Uh, and Paul mentioned it earlier, but really Neighbors and Nations exists this week of the year to refocus us, uh, to remind us, to challenge us, to equip us that we are a people of mission. That we are called as redeemed people to live our lives on mission. In fact, our identity statement as a church, maybe you've heard this before, we say it like this, we are a redeemed community of Jesus followers on mission together. There you go. You passed the final. It's part of who we are. It's part of our identity. We are a missional people. We have been set apart for a mission. Now, what we want to do in these next few days is we want to remind ourselves of that not because we live on mission one week out of the year, but that every part of our lives is built and shaped around who God is and this mission that he's called us to be a part of. And we want to be reminded and challenged of that this morning. So I want to kick it off. You can just hold your place there in Matthew. We're going to get there in a few minutes. But I want to kind of give you the big picture of the Bible and remind you of a reality this morning the reason we are a missional people, the reason we've been called to this mission is because the God of the Bible is a God of mission. God, from the beginning of Scripture to the end of Scripture, is on a redemptive rescue mission. Thus, His people, whom He has redeemed, us, we are called to that mission as well. Let me just remind you of that. You can follow these on the screen. All the way back in the book of the, the beginning of your Bible, Genesis chapter 3, we see the beginning of God's mission. Adam and Eve created perfect fellowship with God. Sin entered the world. They sinned against God. They rebelled. God enters the garden. And here's what he says, Genesis chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. And they, Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and among the trees of the garden. Now watch this. God had every right at that moment to consume them in their rebellion. But in verse 9 it says, But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? you. That was an invitation, that was a posture of mission in pursuit of Adam and Eve to restore them in right relationship with himself. That's the posture of God throughout history. He's on a redemptive mission. Genesis chapter 12 verse 2 and 3, you know this, God says, I will make you a great nation, speaking to Abraham, I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Anyone who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So God creates a nation, a people, the people of Israel, that from Israel there would be light to the nations. There would be a Messiah to the nations. Why? Because God is on mission. God is on mission. The book of Isaiah, I'll just give you this really quick. Isaiah 45, 22. Scripture says this, Look to me and be saved, 
all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So God's mission is global in its scope from the beginning of history. Now let me show you the end of history. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. How does this whole thing of God's redemptive plan culminate? We know where history is going. Revelation 7, 9 and 10 says this. John, given a vision, he says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, every tribe and people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Beloved, be encouraged. We are part of a mission that cannot fail. God is on a redemptive mission of redeeming men and women from every tribe and tongue and people and neighborhood and home and village and town on the planet for his glory. You and I, as redeemed ones, get to be privileged, really, to be a part of that mission. Now, what does that look like practically for us as disciples? What does that look like for us as a local church fellowship called TCBC? I want you to go to that passage in Matthew 28, and Jesus makes it really specific. Speaking here at the end of his ministry, he's speaking to his disciples. Makes it really clear, a a vein of this mission, a focus of this mission. Because I want you to know, before... Before there's the great multitude of Revelation 7, there's the great commission of Matthew chapter 28. We're living right now in between the the great commission of Jesus, what he's called us to, and that day that there's going to be the great multitude of all the redeemed from all time, from every nation, worshiping our great king. We're in between that right now. Jesus gives us this great commission, Matthew 28. I know we're all probably very familiar with this, but I want you to listen to this afresh, this great commission from Jesus, Matthew 28, 18. He says this. Jesus came and said to them. Again, let's be clear. Jesus is speaking to his disciples then, and he's speaking as well to his disciples today, us. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, go therefore and make disciples. It's very specific. He's very clear what this going aspect of being a disciple of Jesus is to ultimately look like. Go therefore and make disciples where? All nations. Global in its scope. What's involved in that? Baptizing them in the name of the Father. That involves evangelism and conversion and sharing the gospel. But it doesn't stop there. He says, go therefore, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He's teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. It involves disciple making and teaching and equipping and growth toward maturity in Christ. And I imagine his disciples, if you could think about it at that moment, were like, Jesus, you're calling us to do that? We've never even left Judea where we live, and you're calling us to be involved in something that's global in scope. And Jesus says, yes, this great commission is way beyond you, but be encouraged. Behold, end of the verse, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So Jesus makes it very specific and very clear what we as his disciples are commissioned by him to build our lives around. So here's what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to give you one big truth, and I'm going to give you some big ideas, really practical, that flow out of this. And then we're going to have a conversation on stage with a couple of your pastors to flesh this out in our lives as a church and what that looks like. So out of Matthew 28, here's a big truth. Jesus' followers are called to go make disciples together. Jesus' followers are called by Jesus himself, equipped, 
commissioned, authorized to be actively engaged in going, intentionality, focus, purpose, to be engaged in this thing called disciple making. And we do that together as a local church. I just want to remind you, the Great Commission, nobody gets a pass. That's for every disciple. The idea of mission is not a department of the church. Some of you maybe think, okay, neighbors and nations, it's, a, it's kind of a mission emphasis. And that's kind of a department of our church. And that's kind of an option for us. No, 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 no. The mission is very core to our identity of who we are. Every disciple of Jesus has a part to play in this. The great commission of Jesus is for every single disciple. Amen? Amen. So every disciple, every Jesus follower is called to be going and making disciples together. Now, just give you some practical handles of this. What this looks like normally as a church, we'll take a passage and we go verse by verse, just like we did in Hebrews. This is going to be a little more topical. So just kind of hang with me. Let me give you some big ideas. Here's big idea number one that flows out of this. Together, we are disciples on mission. Now, I want to give you some applications of that. Together, we are disciples on mission. If you want to turn in your Bible, you can, or the verse will be on the screen. I'm going to go back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Jesus speaking to his disciples, some of them before they were even disciples of his, and he says a verse that really helps us understand this going and making disciples. He says this, uh, Mark 1, 17. Jesus said to them, follow me. And I will make you become fishers of men. So in this whole dynamic of going and making disciples, let's be very clear. What is a disciple? A disciple is one who follows Jesus. A disciple is one who has submitted to Christ. They have died to self. Their life is devoted to Jesus. Their identity is completely wrapped up in Him. Jesus says, follow me. That's a disciple. But then he says, as a disciple, he says, follow me and I will make you become. Something I want you to hear really clearly this morning for us as a church. A disciple is one who follows, but also a disciple is one who is continually growing. A disciple of Jesus is one who is never satisfied with where you are in your discipleship, your growth. You're continually growing and pursuing And becoming more like Christ, moving from conversion to submission to devotion to comprehension. You're always growing. But Jesus says it doesn't stop there. I think a church is a really unhealthy church if the church merely focuses on growing. That growing always leads to going. (laughs) Jesus says, follow me. I will make you become fishers of men. In other words, the the purpose, the focus of your life will not just be your own growth. The overflow of that will be mission. Every disciple of Jesus is called to actively engage in disciple making. You growing and helping others take their next step toward Jesus Christ. That's for all of us. So I want us to see real clearly as a church, together we are disciples on mission. I hope that balance is always here for us as a local church. If you've been here for 10 years, if you've been here for 10 days or 10 months and you're new, we want you to know our our goal as disciple-making church is that you are always growing. You are challenged in so many ways here to be taking your next step in your relationship with Jesus, but at the same time, always challenged and equipped and mobilized to be going. Not just what Jesus is doing in you, but yes, what Jesus is doing through you. See, in my life, in your life, I would even go as far to say, I would even go as far to say an unhealthy focus only on growing apart from going is unfaithful. 
but a focus that's only about going. We got to go, we got to go, we got to go. Without a focus on growth, it's going to be unfruitful. That's a pretty good word right there. I got to like that, right? It's not just about growing, it's about going as well. But it's never just about going, it's about us growing as disciples. That's what Jesus is calling us to do and to be and to be involved in. He says to these disciples, he says, I will make you become fishers of men. I imagine when you hear this call to disciple making for all of us in this mission, something through your mind goes like this. You go, all right, Pastor Mike, are you, are you telling me I've got to add something else to my already busy life? I've got to add this role of a disciple maker and on mission. And maybe that's what Jesus' disciples were saying here. But I want you to hear this really clearly this morning. To these professional fishermen here, he's saying, you don't add the mission of God to your life. You build your lives around the mission of God. He says, look, I'm not even saying you have to stop being a fisherman. But that, fi that, that livelihood of Fishing is going to change for you and it's going to be a tool because primarily you are a disciple of Jesus now who is engaged in making disciples of others. That's practically true for you. That's practically true for me. What that means is before you're a businessman, you are a disciple of Jesus who is called to use that and leverage that to be a disciple maker. I'm saying that before you're a teacher, a, a barber, a doctor, a lawyer, a, even a parent, you're a disciple of Jesus who is called to engage your life in helping people take their next step toward Christ. I will use and leverage my business to do that. I will use and leverage the teaching role God's given me. Parents, your role is to say, what is my child's next step toward Christ? That discipleship begins in the home, as we saw a picture of that earlier. I love what J.D. Greer said. <clears throat> He's a pastor in North Carolina. He makes this really practical. He says, whatever you're good at, do it well to the glory of God and do it somewhere strategic for the mission of God. Choosing a career, choosing a place I'm going to land, choosing a place where it is. Yes, Lord, use my gifts as a teacher, as a businessman, whatever it is. But let me never forget the primary role of my life is I'm a disciple of Jesus, called to be a disciple maker wherever you plant me. So for us, together, we are disciples on mission. I'll give you a second quick application this morning is this. Secondly, <clears throat> together... We go to our neighbors. Okay, what's the scope of our mission? Uh, together we go to our neighbors. Uh, the idea of go here is, is intentionality. The idea of go, as Jesus says it, is movement. It, it involves action. It's not this passive, well, I might get there, or just kind of as I'm going along. No, there's this intentionality about our lives and it starts among our neighbors who are near when we talk about neighbors and nations and even the mission don't let your mind just go to over there and excuse yourself and ourselves from being actively involved right here where God has planted you it's both let me give you a couple of verses on that Acts 1 8 Jesus again kind of a an addition to the great commission or the Acts version of the great commission says but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Why? What for? You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's where they were. Didn't stop there. Judea and Samaria. It's going to involve crossing some boundaries. And ultimately it's to the ends of the earth. The point is, brothers and sisters, this mission that he's called us to, this great commission, it does begin for each one of us right where we are among our neighbors. We are called to live our lives observing. That's, that's one of our disciple-making process, disciple processes here is that we are we're always observing. We wear the lenses of a disciple-maker. And sometimes it's easy to think, well, yeah, I'll just get on a plane, I'll go to the other side of the world, and then I'll gauge the Great Commission and overlook the opportunities that are right in front of you. It begins in our homes. Here's a tough one. It involves our extended families. 
members in your extended family, your oikos right now, if you will, that you know their next step to Jesus. You know the next step that they need to take. But you're unwilling, <clears throat> you're unwilling to go to them. Same for me. So the idea of disciple making begins in our extended families, our homes, our spheres of influence. We have something called our three names cards where we pray for those who are in our spheres of influence. Lord, give me the opportunity to help them take their next step. We pray, we go our workplace, we go to our neighbors, but it doesn't stop there. I'll give you a third big idea really quick. We are disciples on mission. We go to our neighbors. <clears throat> we also go to the nations. See, Jesus makes this really clear here, and sometimes it's sometimes it's hard to get our mind around what that looks like as a local church here in East Tennessee. What do you what do you mean we go to the nations? Matthew 18, Jesus makes it clear, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. In other words, he's making clear from the beginning this mandate for us is never just here, it's always global in its scope. The mission of God is always global. Listen to Psalm 96, 2 through 4. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Tell of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. Why? For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. So when you think about the Great Commission and Jesus saying, yes, it's to be among all nations. Just know it is to be global in its scope because our God is worthy to be worshipped among every tribe and people and tongue in every place on earth. Amen? He is worthy of that. So as a local church, we pursue partnership opportunities globally where we can engage with gospel global partners around the world to do this. How in the world could we partner globally? How can we be involved among the nations? We do that through partnerships. Let me give you an example of the book of Philippians really quick. Paul is writing back to the church at Philippi. He says in Philippians 1, 3 through 5, he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making my prayer with joy. He says this, I love you, I thank God for you, I'm grateful for you, local church at Philippi. Why? Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. That word partnership is a word we love. It's the word koinonia. As you say, wait a minute, well, it has to involve food and casseroles, right? Well, no. Koinonia is a shared partnership involving our lives in something bigger than, bigger than us. Paul said to this little church at Philippi, because of your partnership and your support of me, everything that God has accomplished through me, you, church at Philippi, have been a part of. So we do that. We partner with, uh, around the world with agencies like the International Mission Board. As a Southern Baptist church, we partner with the IMB through teams and funding and going. And the, the IMB is an agency that sends out 3,526 missionaries are on the field through the IMB. And as we partner as a church, we get to be a part of that, something much bigger than ourselves. We get to partner with an organization called Sin Network. You get to be a part of that. I get to be a part of that. That we Just this past year, we got to travel to five different nations and take 50 church planners and involve them in God's work around the world to partner like our church partners. We, we get to invest in that many churches. We get to invest in that many places around the world. You're a part of that. We're a part of that. We get to partner with families like the Jeremiah's family that unfortunately could not be here today. But our church has been involved with this family and their work in Uganda and Kabang, Uganda, among an unreached people group called the Karamajong. And we've sent teams and we've sent funds and many of you have gone there and we've cared for them and we're their sending church. We hold the rope and we get to partner and Tri-Cities Baptist Church here in East Tennessee gets to make a gospel difference in a place in Africa called Kabong through partnerships, the disciple-making globally that God has called us to be a part of. So we are disciples called to be on mission. 
We're called to go to our neighbors. We go to the nations. And then final point this morning is this. Together we give to go. Don't you know, church, one of the primary ways that we are a part of advancing the mission and advancing the gospel is through generous financial giving. Again, you see that in the church at Philippi. When Paul writes the letter back to the church at Philippi, it's really a letter back to them to thank them for their investment in him. He says in chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, Paul says, And you Philippians yourself know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you alone. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help, financial help, for my needs once and again. In other words, giving as a church is a part of advancing this commission of Jesus to make disciples around the world. You've heard it. If you're a part of our church, you know the culture that's here. One of the ways we do that is through our regular tithes and offerings. Another way we do that is through over and above in something called Give to Go. Give to Go is our primary missions fund. It's designed where we give over and above, and those funds leave our church to serve organizations locally like Agape Women's Fellowship, to help reach college students at ETSU, to help plant churches in places like Colorado, to help, help global partnerships in places like Portugal and South Asia and Africa, we get to be a part of that through our giving. And we as a church can do so much more when we partner together than we can on our own. So what I want to do now is I want to take just a few minutes and we're going to try to make this really practical with some guys up on stage in just a minute. But before we do that, I, I want you to kind of see a picture of where all this comes together globally. I'm going to invite you to watch this short video. And it is a video of Selvin, our ministry partner in Uganda, it was taken a few months ago. He's very sick and couldn't be here, but it's really just an update of how we have been involved as a church there, and then we'll talk a little bit more of how we're going to continue to be involved in the future. So would you take a look at this video, and then we'll go into our elder conversation. Hey, Crowd, Christ is Baptist.